Welcome to the Surfcast Podcast, your weekly source for surf fishing discussions, tactics, interviews, news, and more. The Surfcast Podcast is hosted by Jerry Audette and Toby Lipinski, two of the most dedicated and obsessed surf fishermen that you will ever meet. The tide is up, the wind is at our back, so let's hit the surf. So I've been noticing there's been a flood of, uh, got my first fresh fish of the year. That's really been starting, um, which is always exciting. It's very exciting. We don't want to downplay the excitement and, you know, the anticipation and everything. But, you know, those fish, those first fish that people are getting, they're real monsters. People are real psyched about those, you know, those really giant uh, 18-inch fish that they've been catching. Um, And, you know, the thing... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which really is part of the lead-in today, but, uh, you know, it's funny. They're all caught in the same thing, and it's a three-inch paddle tail or a SB minnow. It feels like that's their prerequisite. I got my first 18-inch fish on the little tiny paddle tail. You know, have you, mm-hmm. been see- have you been seeing that? I mean, I feel like it's the same every year, so. Oh, of course. I mean, uh, to a degree, I actually, <laughs> as much as it drives me, insane i seek it out a little bit like i look for it you know it's like self-torture i gotta go see who and where uh is doing it and it's always that same like you say it's those little jiggy things the coco the storm shad the tsunami shad and it it it, it, like the self-fulfilling prophecy of got my first schoolie of the year yeah no kidding because of what you're throwing but i like it like i said i kind of look for it look for it as well because I uh, can kind of decipher what's going on. And if I haven't quite gotten out yet, yeah, like, that's true. You know, I haven't gone out myself yet today, um, but it gets me thinking about, okay, if it's moving there, it's moving over there. Maybe I should get out. And I, I to be honest, I started setting some plugs together. I started building that bag so that when like nice. my sequence of days piece together where I know it's go time, I'm a little closer to being ready. And I mean, you know, we're seeing the, the, the little rubber jig stuff. We're seeing the SPs. First thing that went into my bag is the needlefish. There we go. Which, <laughs> anyone that knows me isn't surprised at that, but that's what we're going to talk about today. The needlefish Perfect transition. as a spring lure uh, in that it's, it's not the go-to for most. It's not the first thing people are throwing, but I would be willing to say when I make my first cast this year, it's better than a 50-50 shot that the first thing I'm going to clip on is the needlefish. Yeah, which is so interesting, right? Because you're because you're right. I mean, when guys think needlefish, they're generally thinking summer and fall or later in the spring. They're mm-hmm. not fishing early, early, early. And, and I don't understand why that is. Do you have any feelings before I launch into my own why mm-hmm. that might be? I mean, I, I think because... The needlefish gets so associated with the needlefish replicates the big sand eels. Mm. And I mean, any spring sand eels I'm seeing are not big. They're tiny, whereas the bigger sand eels are that summer and definitely into the fall. So I I, I mean, if you put me on a spot, that's my thought as to why people don't jump. Surf casters don't jump right away in the spring to the larger needlefish. Yeah, it's weird. I don't really get it. I mean, for me to lead to get right into it you know a plug for me is a problem solving device you know the surf is a problem to solve in a lot of ways i mean it's fun and i don't want to make it sound like it's a job or anything like that but it's you know my my whole goal is to figure out what the fish will hit and what what the fish will take and the problem of getting them to take it and so choosing a plug has nothing to do with rules it has nothing to do with like well this you use this in these situations and you use this in this situation Obviously, I'm not going to take a Danny and start thrashing it on the surface like a pencil. Like, there are some sort of parameters. But beyond that, I don't care about, oh, this is supposed to be for this and this is supposed to be for this. I'm going to look at the water and think about what the fish are doing and then try to solve the problem. And the needlefish solves a lot of problems. It's a very versatile plug, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Absolutely. It's, it can, I mean, realistically, you can fish it just any whether it's a floater or a sinker i mean you can you can fish it as a pencil popper as a needlefish as a darter as a glide as a bottom dredger i mean there's not a whole lot you you can't do that with a bucktail you can't do the flip side reverse with most pencil poppers you know so it's 
it's more versatile without a doubt than is given credit for. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, this just dawned on me hearing you speak right at the beginning there. The assumption that the early season fish have to be little teeny tiny ones and you go and target that, that isn't necessarily true, especially for you, right? I mean, you're, you're on big fish, I mean, looking for them pretty much right away. Yeah, and even, you know, e- 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 even um, the earlier spring, like the time frame of, I mean, realistically, before when this episode's coming out, the fish, I don't t- bother with this bite as much as I used to, but I used to start April 1st. I was looking for 25 to mid 30 pound class fish and not just looking for them, finding them while others were finding schoolies. And I think I wrote about it in one of the SJ columns at one point, um, you know, that, right. that story behind all of that. I won't rehash it again today, but I right from the start i'm looking for in the very least fish that are in the mid teens on up i mean i'm not my spring hunting is not the little rat schoolies on the sp minnows and the uh, shad bodies by any extent yeah and it's interesting actually you know as we talk about this live here i'm thinking you know all the rest of the year uh surf casters you know we preferentially choose baits that big fish are on and we say oh you know you and i are not match the hatch people, um, but they're trying to you know match hatch and blah blah blah. I think, I think those those little tiny paddle tails and such are self fulfilling prophecy. Like you said, you're throwing those purely because that's what those little fish are most likely to hit, and that maybe in those same situations there might be fish mixed in even there. That while they're not going to be 25 pounds, they might be you know 28 inches versus 18 inches, and you're preferentially getting these really, really small fish because you're feeding them these little tiny things. That, 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 look, a 28-inch fish is going to take one of those paddle tails, of course. I mean, I'm not saying that yeah. at all. Of course, it's not a big fish at all. It's still a small, that's still a small fish. But it's interesting to think that you're, there's no match the hatch situation. There's no presentation situation. It's just like throw these little things at these fish because they're going to hit them. Yeah. I mean, like I have a, I got two spots in mind that I'm thinking about right now where probably as this episode's going live, the weather's right, guys are catching schoolies. And there could be hundreds of guys between these two spots. And I put a good chunk of money that 99.9% of them are throwing those small things right now. It's, and I don't understand where that became the rule. Yeah. The, 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 and that's really, it's, it's a rule in our minds. It's a rule in their, you know, our collective as the anglers, not you and I, obviously, that that's what you're throwing. I mean, guys have made careers writing about that too, that like the first trips of the year, it's these little tiny things for the first schoolies. And, and well, it's fun to have that like, uh, um, friendly competition between little groups, your friends or socially to get onto those fish first. Even if, okay, you bang one or two trips on that, and then they stick with it. Like, these guys are running the whole month of April into May and sticking on it, and then they're like, oh, all of a sudden the big fish showed up. Yeah. Nah, they were there all along. You just didn't throw anything they wanted. That's right. That's right. And and I'm the first one to say, you know, if you like going out at, you know, late afternoon into sunset and catching those first fresh fish, and it's like a harbinger of spring, and it's a tradition, cool. You should do you. you. There's no, like... You know, you and I have a uh, an interesting perspective on a lot of things, I think, and we're sort of out there. That's great. But then don't do it for four weeks and tell me that there's no big fish around, and then that's all there is, and that's why you're throwing it. Because mm-hmm. that's not true. You've just, you've self-fulfilled prophecy, right? Yeah. And I think that that's also interesting to think about that you're also preferentially choosing places. Now, we're getting away from the needlefish. What happened to the needlefish? Weren't we supposed to be talking about the needlefish? No, I'm ready to go back to it, because <laughs> it's, it's going to lead into that. I, I... But, but my <laughs> my question for you is are you you're not choosing locations that are needlefish locations. You're choosing no. spots and then using needlefish. Certainly. The progression of where I go in the spring is based on where I uh, feels my best shot at those spring large fish getting intercepted initially. Uh they're which in all of the cases is large bait related herring bunker uh uh, american shad um 
whatever else, the Porgies starting to come in to spawn, Seabass coming in, those same schoolies that these guys are targeting on the small stuff might be. So I'm looking at it initially when I'm picking my April, May spots on those factors. And then when I get there, I then figure out what lures I can fish in there. And like I said, the first one going into my bag at any of these spots is the needlefish, whether it's um, a shallow sandy beach and I'm opting for the seven inch 24 seven needlefish because I know that thing is going to fish perfectly acceptably in three to five feet of water. And it looks like a herring, right? Which I 100, 101% <laughs> think the needlefish looks like things like that. Like the herring, those, we'll call them like the silver baits. I think it was Dave Anderson at one point that I, I recall him saying, call it, referring to those as like the silver baits, the, you know, the shiny, deep bodied, slender uh, uh, food source for the striped bass. And as I'm saying, if you haven't heard me make this connection before, the needlefish to those from the side view. Now, if you put side view a bunker next to a needlefish, yeah, they don't look like each other. I'll, I'll give you that. But if you take those very same, the lure and the bait, you look at them for the profile from below. Stare, hold them above your head. Look at the belly of each. It is the exact same silhouette. And that, I didn't have that revelation myself. I actually picked up on that years ago from one of the guys that fished Spring Run on the rivers. And I was talking to him about some new lures, not new to everyone, like new lure we're going to try in that area, which is the redfin, which obviously not new. Everybody knows redfin, et cetera. When we were going back and forth talking about it, he took it out of my hand and literally put it up above his head and looked up for the silhouette on a light and said, that would work. And I was like, it was one of those aha moments that what the hell is he talking about? And as I'm saying to myself, I realized the fish, the striped bass, are sitting in a low position because this the spring fishery on the rivers and the current. They're sitting low to the bottom, looking up, and a herring buzzes by, and all they're getting is that quick silhouette on the sky or the night on the uh, moon or the, the, the bridge lights. Contrast. And, yeah, it, it was amazing. Like, granted, at that, you know, a, a red fin and a herring do look kind of similar even from the side. To a degree more so than they would you know a needlefish to a bunker but that belly silhouette is so spot on and it took me a little bit of time from there to transition that concept of that silhouette for the needlefish fished around bunker fished around the shad fished around the herring and as soon as i started doing it, it started working like it was it was not like i'm gonna try this for a couple years and see if it can work it was like when in the first couple of trips it produced um and that's that's why i said when i started putting my bag together for the first few spring trips the first thing that went into the bag was the needlefish yeah and you know and i'll invoke his name again we you just mentioned him but dave actually was one of the first ones i heard because i've known him longer than i've known you but um he when we fished together a little bit but just talking with him when he was talking about early season and herring he said one of the first things that went in his bag was his flat glide. And it had nothing to do with the fact that he made it because he used other stuff. Beachmaster, I think he said before, and you know, whatever. I, I don't remember the other ones he was talking about. But he was saying, you know, that's one of the things he fishes around herring. And I had never heard anyone say that. I had heard people say, oh, you know, you want to fish swimmer. You want to fish this. Mm -hmm. You know, sluggo was something I had heard before. But needlefish is definitely not something someone's putting in their bag. Clearly, there people are. We're not saying that we invented yeah. this, obviously. But I had no. never heard anyone say that. And we know that 99.99% of guys are not doing that, even if they're not throwing the little paddle tails. They're doing mm -hmm. other stuff. Um, but they're certainly not focusing on those very early fish with needlefish. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just don't understand. Because even those really small fish are going to take you know, something like a needlefish. Now, I, I love seeing people using single hooks on those little tiny fish. The, the, like, you know, a jig head. That's great. You should mm -hmm. be doing that. Yes. But I think at night, fishing, especially at night, fishing the needlefish around some of these places where you might fish the small, find the smaller fish, you could potentially have a lot more productivity, let alone if you're focusing on those large baits like what you're talking about. I mean, that's something completely different, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's funny too. Like, let, let's take that night scenario. Probably 
a, or a, a good portion of the surf casters going out at night. Let's say they're fishing, just for argument's sake, around a herring-type feed in the spring. There's probably a pretty good chance they're throwing a 9-inch sluggo. Right. Like, right. take a 9-inch sluggo, put it next to a 7- to 9-inch needlefish. They're the same damn thing. It's the same damn thing. Silhouette-wise. Silhouette-wise. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. And, and that, like... That's another aspect of this whole thing that, like, the the needlefish is overlooked. It's so simple. It's like the the simplest, you know, answer is right there in front of your face, and that's it with the needlefish here. And, and you know, comparing the two, the needlefish to, like, the sluggo, other soft plastics that are out there in that size range, I mean, anyone that's thrown both knows the casting ability on right. the needlefish far outweighs those soft plastics. And, you know, that's another thing with the spring. At least in my experience, is it's it's usually a little bit of wind or weather, and and you know it's not those midsummer calm nights where you can throw anything you want or the winds at your back. Sometimes you need something that you can punch into the wind that you're going to be able to stay in contact with. So, like it just keeps checking off these boxes of the needlefish is the right thing, and yeah, it, it works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'll go back to something we said earlier, which is that. The versatility is key, and one of the things that makes the needlefish versatile is that it sinks. And a sinking mm -hmm. plug generally is more versatile than a floating plug. I, I think we can all agree with that, and if you don't know why, then Jerry's becoming famous for this, but we'll talk about this in another episode, maybe. But <laughs> Take a shot. He said it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Um, but the sinking, a slow sinker is very versatile because you can work it up and down in the column pretty much anywhere you want because you, you, know, you can let it touch down and you know, all that mm -hmm. stuff. But I will say, you know, something, another connotation of the bucktail, or the bucktail, the needlefish that has nothing to do with season is this idea that you cast it out and you reel it back slow. And I will say that in the spring, I'm often fishing current where warm water is moving out. Okay. And there's all kinds of examples of that. Many of them, you're probably picturing your head right now, the listener, and you're wrong, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to say and when I go to these places, uh, uh, many other anglers early in the spring would be bringing their small bucktail. They would be bringing their little paddle tail. You know, John Skinner has made uh, some of that early spring bucktail drifting stuff really, really popular, even though it's always been popular. In those situations, I drift a needlefish. I drift a small, I, we're going to mention it again, the 24-7, but there's lots of other options. I use Big Ed, you can use a Super Strike. But I'm casting it up current and I'm drifting it down just like you would do with the bottle, with a bottle plug, with a bucktail. Why am I getting my, I need to, I need to go back to school on my plugs here. My God, <laughs> <laughs> the bucktail or the jig head, right? But yeah. the thing about the needlefish is it's a bigger profile. They are easier for me to control in the current. Okay. And they're subtle. They are more subtle. I mean, a bucktail subtle, but a paddle tail is not as subtle. And I find sometimes when those fish are looking up in those currents, and again, maybe not 20 feet, maybe five, and they're, you know, not, I'm not going to say lethargic, but maybe they're, they're not quite as aggressive. That subtle swing of that, of that needlefish in the spring can be deadly. Because again, I'm trying to solve the problem. Yeah. And that, like, that's another thing with you just reminded me of, like, taking that, paddle tail shad and it's tail thump 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 if you've let's just take the herring if you've ever watched herring and i probably have spent way more time than is the average and definitely way more time than is healthy just watching herring in the water i mean you and me were like flopping around in the water last year trying to grab them and stuff yeah, yeah. we're like into herring. yeah it's fun and, and, i mean i i'm actually like thinking about poking around as we're recording this of some of my early herring spots, like those early herring runs. And when I find them, I will literally sit, I'll set up camp for a half hour and I'll just watch how they swim. And, and some of my runs are, no exaggeration, three feet wide that have thousands coming up. Some are 30 feet wide and have thousands coming through them. So in different conditions and watching how the herring hold in the current almost effortlessly at times, mm -hmm. like no movement. That's they're right. They're moving against flowing water, but they're not moving. They're not kicking a paddle tail. And they just do this little subtle back side to side pushing around. 
which is what a needlefish so perfectly does if you're fishing it like you're saying coming across a current swinging it through um, whether you're diagonal where you're holding in it i mean way more so of a, 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 a replicating the swimming motion than a bucktail well a bucktail might be kind of close i guess but a shad body definitely more so than like a you know plastic swimmer like a bomber or or so or an sp minnow way more so than a danny on the surface like yeah, yeah the danny yeah, yeah. i don't think i've ever seen a herring look like a danny yeah that's right granted they hit them like sure but it doesn't look like it you know that's right <laughs> that's right you know and actually you just made me think of something right now along those lines what you can't do well with a paddle tail is also give it that dart that mm -hmm. jerk, that that all of a sudden that sudden movement, they just don't work as well for that as a needlefish does. And if you're thinking about the herring, you know, very relatively little movement in the current, not in the current, whatever, they almost don't move. It's so effortless. But when they get disrupted, they zoom, they zoom. Yeah. You know, you can do that with a needlefish, which is such a fishy behavior in general, right? And you can't do that with those little paddle tails, let alone I mean the little paddle tails don't look like any of those bigger baits, which are so important. <laughs> for all you know from new jersey all the way up to you know the canada <laughs> yeah kennebec and the penobscot you know and i mean you know so it, it's an it's an interesting thing and you know one more thing too everybody assumes in the spring the fish are super lethargic and they're not active and blah 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 and the water's you know 48 degrees or 46 degrees or 44 mm -hmm. degrees and there's no way that they're gonna you know hunt these things you got to bang them right in the face with you know the jig or whatever but i have found and this is a question i'm getting to a question i have found that fish in the spring 44 degrees 46 degrees sometimes when these big baits are around these fish are bananas i mean they're willing to absolutely destroy plugs just blasting in the shallow water after these things blasting top water i mean have you had that experience too absolutely the the reference i was making earlier to years ago when i really fished it hard early april time frame i was throwing pencil poppers <laughs> in new england to very large fish and they didn't it wasn't like they'd come up and just slurp it like you know a, a, a trout taking a little spinner or something i mean they would hammer it i i remember the first time i took my wife who was my girlfriend at the time to one of these bites she it was like early time one of the first time she'd ever actually surf fished we'll call it and she was like blown away by these fish exploding cartwheeling out of the water and showing no signs of concern that the water was cold i mean we're standing you know we're waiting out and after an hour or so like your knees start to ache because it's cold like there's it's not like i'm fishing warm water i mean they have every bit of energy um, and, and I really think it has a bit to do with the larger food source. You know, yeah. let, let's say they've, whether those fish are fresh and they just arrived or they're holdovers that are expanding their range, they've essentially been, they've either been grubbing and finding whatever they can all winter long, or they just traveled a good distance. So either way, I feel they need a, a higher food intake, you know, better, you know, a bigger meal. And they're kind of willing to throw caution to the wind at energy, exp uh, you know, expending the energy wise to get those big baits. I mean, some of the like bunker related early May needlefish bites that I've had, those fish hit like a train and fought like any fish throughout the season. Probably harder than, a, than an August fish, you know, swimming in 70 plus degree water. That's right. <laughs> That's they, right. They go to the end. I mean, till your hand is on that fish, they are still chugging along. And yeah, I don't, I don't give anything to the credence of, of gotta slow it down, gotta take it easy to try to tempt them. I mean, that's right. You're still rep. In my opinion, my attempts, I'm just putting that food source in front of them the same way I would at any other time of the season. That's right. So again, just to sum up a little bit. Because I just want to say this again. I want to make this clear. Catching those first few small fish of the season is a harbinger of spring. And it's a rite of passage. And if you love it, do it. We're definitely not saying that. But we're also suggesting that if you want to catch bigger fish or transition more quickly for your season, 
then you really should consider including needlefish in your bag and fishing them this spring because you may be missing out on opportunities you don't even know are there, especially as rules get more and more entrenched due to social media because people see people doing things and then everybody starts doing the same thing. Be cognizant of the fact that there are opportunities you may be missing and that mm -hmm. plugs don't have rules. There's no rules. You make them solve problems. So go solve the problem this spring and fish that needlefish. This has been a weekly edition of the Surfcast podcast. You can find out more about the podcast and find more episodes at surfcastpodcast.com. And be sure to check us out on social media at the Surfcast Podcast.